Hello, my name's Emma and I'm a member of the Abbey Church family. I've been given such a brilliant subject and title to talk to you about this morning, God's love and ours, from 1 John 4 verses 7 to 21. And I'm just going to make a couple of introductory points about today's theme, God's love and ours. Those of you who heard me preach on Psalm 100 in August will recognise the t-shirt that I'm wearing. When I was just 19, I had the opportunity to accompany my beloved mum on a trip to Hong Kong to work amongst members of the Ward City's triad gangs in Jackie Pullinger's Hang Foot Camp. Amongst the varied jobs that I undertook in the camp, I worked in the laundry alongside the incredible Elfrida. She had been a sex worker into her late 50s until her veins had collapsed due to her heroin use, so her pimps had thrown her out like rubbish onto the street, where she was found by Christians from the camp who knew that she wasn't rubbish, who picked her up in their loving arms and carried her home because they believed in the God of love that we read about in 1 John chapter 4. Alfreda came to believe in this God of love, and quite simply, he changed her life forever. This gift given to me by Alfreda, who is long dead now, I wear today in memory of how she loved, and in order to make my first points, love changes people's lives, and love is unforgettable. In introduction, I also want to say that when Johnny and I married 18 years ago, I had 31,102 verses in the Bible from today's to choose from to put into my wedding ring. And I chose one of the verses from today's passage about love that has been worn around my ring finger every day since then. I will expand more on it and five other verses that I've chosen from today's passage in a bit. Finally, what is so meaningful to me about the subject that I've been given today is that it is universal and it is inclusive. It is about something that everyone has hopefully experienced. However, I am aware that there are people here this morning for whom thoughts of love are painful. There may be people present who have experienced disrupted love or a scarcity of love in their life. I know that there are people here who feel as if their loved ones have been taken way too soon, and that causes pain. My prayer is that each and every one of you takes away something today that you hear about love that is, for you, unforgettable and makes a difference to how you live your every day. When I was a child in the 70s, something that I often noticed that people had in their toilets was a little book full of cartoons called Love Is, in which were humorous drawings and statements summing up the many ups and downs of love. Take a moment now to consider how you would finish the sentence, Love Is. Towards the end of her preach at Ebby on the 31st of October, Sue Allen posed this insightful question. What does love look like where you are? And I pose it for you now at the start of mine. What does love look like where you are? The first verse that I want to talk about from today's passage is verse 7. Let us love one another. In his book, Keep Your Love On, Danny Silk writes, quality love relationships do not happen by accident. Real love is built the old-fashioned way through hard work. I would add to that that there are no shortcuts in the process of loving. Recently, I was watching a Chasing Vines DVD with my Beth Moore Bible study group when Beth Moore posed this thought-provoking question. Who in your life has loved you best? And what has that looked like? I ask you to answer that same question in your own mind now. Who in your life has loved you best? And what has that looked like? Among the several people that my mind went to 
It alighted on my beloved Nan, who died a few months after I got married. What a person in my life. What love. What impact. As I'm sure that you also find, it is often impossible to be able to put into words or sum up what loved ones have meant to us, what they continue to mean to us. I'm a poet, and I sometimes find that poetry is the only way for me to even attempt to try and sum up people, feelings, experiences. This short poem is about my love for my incredible Nan. Wish you were here. Wish you were here with your velvet skin, pocketing your huge love in its soft pouches. Wish I could run my unsteady finger through your creases and your folds just one more time. Wish I could fish for mints and humbugs in your stiff penny as you shell lunchtime peas over yellowed formica in your warm kitchen hub. Wish I could beckon you back down life's dim corridor and tippy-toe up to meet your bent crown with how wide and deep and long my love for you is. Even though my nan is no longer walking on this earth, her phenomenal love for me feels in no way reduced, no way diluted, no way gone. That is the nature of love. It does not diminish over time. It is never forgotten. During lockdown, I realised that my position has shifted a bit since writing this poem about my nan several years ago. None of us can call our loved ones back just one more time. But we don't need to, because love lasts. It says in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 13, that love remains. How does love remain in your life? I'll tell you how it does in mine. In the middle of a pandemic, Johnny and I were walking out of Costco with our lockdown booty of toilet rolls and salmon when we spotted Marg and Pete, friends who'd recently moved back to Bristol after helping to lead a church in France on their way into Costco. The following week, Pete was diagnosed with bowel cancer. He died 17 days later. When Marg asked me to write a poem about him to read at his Thanksgiving service, I knew exactly what I would write. It would be all about how love remains. This is its first verse. Your indelible trace. The founder of forensic science said that every contact leaves a trace. That's so true of you. You leave such an unforgettable, enhancing, indelible trace on us. Your unassuming fingerprints soothe our lives. Never to be erased, covered over, buried. The love from our loved ones remains with us, even when their earthly body doesn't. Their fingerprints forever pressed into our heart. And what is so profound to me about this verse, let us love one another, is that it works both ways. I want to say this so strongly to you this morning, that our love also, dear friends, leaves an indelible trace on people's lives, an indelible trace, not faded by time or circumstance. In February half term 2020, Johnny invited me into the office of the academy chain, where he's a data protection officer, for me to see the office where he works on a school site. When I began preparing for this preach many weeks ago now, I remembered seeing an inspirational poster on a bright green background up in that office 18 months ago, and I asked Johnny to take a photo of it so I could include it today. This is what it says about pupils with regards to the education lists who come into their lives. 
They may not remember everything you said, but they will remember how you made them feel. This is so true about our loved ones. I would expect that when I asked you earlier who in your life has loved you best, row upon row of you here remembered in an instant how that person made you feel. Love is like that. This was so powerfully illustrated to me when I was watching an audience with Adele last Sunday where Adele was singing a selection of her old and new songs interspersed with questions from celebrity guests. Emma Thompson asked Adele this, when you were young, and was there someone who supported you or protected you from all of the trials and tribulations of life and inspired you to go on? Without a second's hesitation, Adele said, her voice wobbling, how when she was at Chestnut Grove, there was an English teacher called Miss MacDonald who left the school when she was 12, who really made them care, and they knew that she cared about them. Then, totally unexpectedly, down through the auditorium came that Miss MacDonald to embrace Adele on the stage. Through tears streaming down her face, Adele said to her beloved teacher, Miss, you really did change my life. I knew in that instant that 20 years on, Adele has not forgotten how that inspirational lady made her feel. And I say to you today, not time, not distance, not circumstance, not people, can ever take away from you or from me how our loved ones made us feel. I'm very much someone who wants a palpable love with me, a love that doesn't merely talk the talk, but a love that walks the walk and accompanies me through this thing called life, a love that makes me feel something. I can categorically tell you without a millisecond of hesitation that God's never-ending, never-failing, persevering love always walks the walk in my life. Love will always matter to me, but this love that I'm going to read about from 1 John 4 matters more to me and will always matter more to me than any other love. This is what it reads in 1 John 4, verse 9 and 10. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into this world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Basil Hume of London claimed that Christians find it easier to believe that God exists than that God loves them. I wonder why that is. Is that the case for you? In her book, The Gospel Without Compromise, Catherine de Huck Doherty writes... The gospel can be summed up by saying that it is the tremendous, tender, compassionate, gentle, extraordinary, explosive, revolutionary revelation of Christ's love. Amen to that. In his book 316, The Numbers of Hope, Max Lucado writes with regard to Jesus' path to the cross, love explains why he came. Love explains how he endured. I believe that love put Jesus on the cross and love kept him there until he cried, it is finished. How Jesus' death on that cross makes me feel today as still, is still as vivid, as life-transforming as it was for me as a seven-year-old girl walking down to the front of Emmanuel Chapel to become a Christian over four decades ago. How does his death 
on the cross make you feel? And what does his love mean to you? Recently, I read of a Chinese Christian who was asked a question before she was about to be baptised in order to ensure that she understood the meaning of the cross. Did Jesus have any sin? The pastor inquired. Yes, she replied. Troubled, he repeated the question. He had sin, she answered positively. The leader set out to correct her, but she insisted. He had mine. That says it all. God's love is so very often an unreciprocated love. He still gives it. People don't care about God's love given to us in the form of his one and only son. He still gives it. People aren't thankful for God's love. He still gives it. People throw God's love back in his face. He still gives it. And God calls us to be givers of love too. 1 John 4 verse 11 reads, Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. As Rachel has actually mentioned um, just now, Ebby's been involved right from when it first happened in Bristol on Maybank holidays in something called The Noise, which has as its strap line showing God's love in practical ways. Noise projects have had a massive positive inf impact on both communities and individuals. As I've said before, let not, let's not be people who merely talk the talk. Let's show people love in meaningful ways that actually impacts their lives. Something I feel very passionate about is being those who bring out someone's best self. Those kind of people who, when people leave us, feel better than they did when they walked through our door. In his book, The Furious Longing of God, Brennan Manning writes that, to affirm a person is to see the good in them that they cannot see in themselves. And Benjamin Disraeli, one of Britain's prime ministers said, the greatest good you can do for another is not just to share your riches, but to reveal to him his own. In her October preach here at Orchard, entitled Through the Roof with Persistence, Rachel Newman from Kintasugi Hope said such profound things about the persevering love of friends when talking about the Bible story of the paralysed man. She said, those friends didn't want their friend remaining on a stretcher, paralysed on a stretcher. It's not the job of the church to heal people. It's the job of the church to get people in front of Jesus. I ask you today, are we content with leaving our families, our friends, our colleagues, paralysed by fear, paralysed by grief, paralysed by the big unknown? Or do we love them enough to carry them to Jesus? To me, love is the ropes that let our people down in front of Jesus, right where they need to be. Whatever circumstances each and every one of us are currently living in, whatever dire straits we're experiencing, each of us can love. I don't know anything about the childhood of Alfreda who gave me this T-shirt, I don't know the circumstances that led her to be a sex worker into her late 50s, but this I know. Elfrida didn't rest on excuses or let them define her future. Elfrida, I'm sure, had more than enough reasons not to love, but she didn't choose to go with any of them. She didn't let anything prevent her from following the way of love that we also are commanded to follow at the start of 1 Corinthians 14. When those who carried her home told her about a God of love who loved her, 
She believed them and she let it transform her life. I, for one, will never forget the way that she loved. There are no special dispensations for us. There are no extenuating circumstances. There are no excuses left for us to use. We are called to love. I've talked a lot today about the importance of demonstrating and showing our love with a love that walks the walk with people and doesn't merely talk the talk. That's the sort of love that I want in my life. A tangible love that makes a difference to my everyday. I am incredibly blessed to have a friend who hasn't let a single week of the pandemic but go by without letting me know that she loves me. Not a single week. When she hasn't cheered me on and encouraged me so loudly, so clearly, so audibly from my sidelines. Maybe you're sat there thinking how lucky someone is to lead a life that gives them the time, the energy and the capacity to give out so meaningfully to someone who is merely a friend. But you'd be wrong. My friend has been into hospital several times over the past year and she lives with daily pain. She has tricky things to juggle with where her extended family is concerned and she has issues and stresses that she is contending with at work. Yet, and yet is such a powerful word, she hasn't let a week go by without letting me, whose life, make no mistake, has been far easier than hers has been, know that I am loved by her. That kind of love matters to me. That kind of love makes a tangible difference to how I see things. A love that is readily given with an open hand when it must be hard to give. She has taught me such an invaluable lesson that it should never be too tough to love, too overwhelming, too much like hard work. My inspirational friend is actually one of our own here in the Ebby family. She is Helena Hayward. She is unforgettable. And with many others, she leaves such an indelible trace on my life. The fifth verse from 1 John 4 that I want to talk about this morning is verse 19. We love because he first loved us. In his book, The Furious Longing of God, Brennan Manning writes one of the most impactful sentences about God that I have ever read and which I feel is so relevant to this verse. There was never a time when God was without love. I'll just read that again. There was never a time when God was without love. That's my God right there. My God is a God of love through and through. What if just maybe my God, the God of 1 John 4, is a God of love through and through and has never been without love? What difference could that make to your life? What difference does it make to mine? Brennan Manning goes on to say in his book, the furious love of God knows no shadow of alteration or change. It is reliable and it is always tender. God chooses to love us. He doesn't have to, he chooses to. It's a phenomenal thing to realise the creator of our awesome universe loves you, chooses to love you, chooses to love me. At the start of my talk, I asked you to complete the sentence, love is, with your own ideas. 
The final verse that I want to share with you today switches the sentence around so that it ends with, is love. And it is the verse that I chose from the 31,102 verses in the Bible to be the one to go inside my wedding ring 18 years ago. 1 John 4 verse 16 reads, God is love. Whoever lives in God, sorry, whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. As people who live in love, God lives in us. What an incredible thought. We are called to be people of love despite our circumstances. Despite those things that knock us down, despite it being hard to be people of love at times. For our wedding, Johnny and I wrote our own wedding vows for each other. These are two of the lines that I wrote in mine. With this ring, I thank you for making my world multicoloured. Thank you for making me more than I was. Who are those people who enhance your life and make its colours more vivid? Who is it that makes you more than you would have been without them in your life? Who brings out your best self and always manages to reveal your hidden treasure that you weren't even sure was there in the first place? And how will you thank them? In closing, I wonder if there will be people 33 years from now, yes, 33 years from now, wearing a metaphorical t-shirt about love given to them by us. People who remember our love and still talk about how unforgettable, how life-giving, how meaningful it was to them. People who still remember how we made them feel. People who know that the memory of our love hasn't dimmed with time, hasn't diluted, hasn't faded. How our fingerprints there press lightly into their life will always be. How our love, that 1 Corinthians 13 verse 13, places above hope and even above faith itself will always remain. And cutching alongside everything, the sure and certain knowledge that our love mattered. I'm going to finish with a series of questions for you to think about. If you've got answers to them that you'd like to share with people, I'm sure that there will be willing listeners at the back after the service. Feel free to go up and share with them your answers. Do you know this God who has never been without love? If you don't, do you want to? Who has loved you best in your life to this point? How will you thank them over the coming weeks and months? To whom does your love matter? To who in this world will your love be unforgettable? And with whom will your love remain? Finally, what is love's indelible trace that you are going to leave pressed into your people? Let me finish with a prayer. Almighty God, may we know in the depths of our being, in our innermost places, that there has never been a time when you 
were without love. Thank you for the people in our life who, has, who have given us their love from an open hand, who have consistently cheered from our sidelines, who have made our world multicoloured. Fill us with gratitude for what they have brought into our lives and for the deposit of love that they leave in them. More and more make us people of love. And may our indelible trace, our abiding legacy left behind us, always be love. Amen.